All right, you guys ready to get rolling? All right, yeah, long awaited time. So uh, well, I wanna welcome you guys here to Las Vegas. Welcome to the FXCM Expo. My name is Jeremy Wagner, and I am the lead trading instructor with Daily FX Education. So for those that may not be familiar with Daily FX, Daily FX is the research and the education arm of FXCM. So the dailyfx.com website, uh, you've got a team of research analysts, and then a team of education specialists that we will post to that website. Uh, we also do several live webinars each week. And so we are here to help teach you guys about trading, hopefully help you guys become a better trader. So as we go along today, the way that I like to conduct the classroom is that if you guys have any questions as we go through any of the, any of the topics here, what I would like for you to do is to go ahead and raise your hand at that moment you have a question, and then we'll take questions as we go along through the presentation. So um, with that, let's go ahead and get rolling. Before we do, uh, we need to take care of some business. And so this is, uh, I want you guys to take a moment and read these risk disclaimers. Essentially what this disclaimer is, is telling us, and you'll notice in this last paragraph, that what I'm about to share with you is not gonna guarantee that, that you're gonna have a profitable account. What I'm gonna share with you is not gonna guarantee that I'm gonna keep you out of losing trades as well. So um, this is just something uh, that hopefully we can incorporate uh, into your trading plan as far as talking about how your strategy and, and trying to match your strategy with the correct market environment, which by the way, um, if you're not sure what your strategy, uh, what type of market condition your strategy might do well in, uh, again, feel free to send me an email, write up your strategy for me, and I'd be happy to look at it and help guide you in when I think that strategy may do well in. And then what you could do is you could focus that strategy during that certain time of day. Uh, one more disclaimer to take care of. There are a couple of trades that I'm gonna be showing in here. They're gonna be hypothetical trades. These are trades that occurred in the past. So therefore, what happened in the past is no guarantee that it's gonna happen again in the future. So I wanna make sure that we point this out as well. I'll give you guys a moment to, to read this slide too. Okay, so here's the outline of what we're gonna be going over today. Uh, this is strategy development one. This is the first in a two part series. In part one, what I'm gonna be sharing with you is we're gonna be talking about matching our strategy to the appropriate market environment because strategies are designed to do well in certain conditions. They're not designed to do well, in my opinion, in all conditions. So what I mean by that is, is let's say you're out on the forums and you hear about this great strategy that this person is boasting about, and so you decide, all right, I'm gonna give this a try. I'm gonna go out and try this strategy. And then it goes out and it seems to do well for a couple of weeks. You're like, wow, this is great. This is the best thing since sliced bread. And then after a couple of weeks, it starts to fall apart. It can't hit the broad side of the barn. And so in essence, what I want you guys to be able to walk away from is to, uh, from this uh, particular workshop, is that the reason that that type of dynamic occurs is because that strategy was geared to do well in a certain type of market environment. And that market environment changed to where it was hitting home runs for a couple of weeks and then all of a sudden, it was uh, giving you um, a, a drawdown and going through some losses. So we're gonna start off with and go over the five decisions on each trade. Uh, these are decisions that you may not even think about. They're very instinctively, um, you just breeze through these. Um, but I wanna reset the table that these are actual decisions that you do need to make and that each one is fairly important um, and, and towards the outcome of the trade or could have an impact towards that trade. Then we're gonna get into range versus trend uh, trend market conditions. Uh, these are two of the more significant conditions you're going to find. We're going to break those apart. And then uh, we're gonna, I'm going to share with you how we can determine what condition that the market may be in. And then also have a strategy in here that I do trade. Uh, we were talking a little bit before the session 
about Asian trading, and so this is a, a strategy that I like to trade on ranges during Asia, and I have you know have it laid out as to when this is um, when the strategy tends to work out all right. So here's the five decisions for each of the traders. Um, we're going to start off with what instrument to trade. We've got several different currency pairs available. And where are we going to start off? Are we going to trade the euro dollar? Are we going to trade the Aussie CAD? Are we going to trade uh, the Mexican peso? Uh, so what instrument do we want to trade? What direction do we want to trade it? Where do I get in? Where do I get out? And then what trade size do I place? I mean, these are really the decisions you have to make on each trade that you make or that you want to place. And in this particular workshop, I'm going to be focusing in on the first two. So what instrument and what direction are we going to trade? That's what this workshop's going to be about. Keep in mind that they're just giving you the buy and sell rules. You're still going to need to match it to the appropriate market environment. So you could if you just blindly go out and start trading these buy and sell rules. Well, you could run into trouble of applying it to a currency pair that may not be matched up with that particular market condition. And then, of course, what trade size is appropriate relative to my account size. Uh, there are a couple of money management or trade management, risk management type of workshops that are going on this weekend as well. So I'm going to focus in on the first two over the, over the next hour here. And one of them is going to be uh, matching our trade to the, to the right market environment range versus trend. So here I've got a chart up on the screen. This is a range bound type of market. This is the pound yen on a daily chart. And so you'll notice that prices are generally stuck in between the blue support line at the bottom and the blue resistance line at the top. Basically, there's a floor and there's a ceiling on this trade, and prices are, are bouncing up and down in between this floor and the ceiling. Now, one way that I can identify this range is prices are generally moving sideways, but you'll also notice I've got this green line moving through the center. See if I can get this. Okay, I can't figure out the red light, but um, I got this green line moving through the center, and you'll notice what I did. And I've got I've got a five-year-old daughter at home, and so I got to tell on myself a little bit. I spend a lot of time looking at charts, and so my daughter, starving for my attention, will come in. Daddy, let's make some trades. <laughs> she knows she knows how to talk my language. And so I thought, okay, this is cool, you know, so I'm going to teach her how to trade. And so trying to figure out how to make this stuff as simple as possible for a five-year-old to understand. And so what I've done is I've shown her how to draw a line on our charts. And I'll be like, all right, Maylin, what I want you to do is I want you to take and draw a line from the, from the furthest point on the left to the furthest point on the right. And so that's essentially what I did here, is I drew this green line from my first candle on the left to my last candle on the right, and you'll notice the line is very slightly sloping downward, but it's essentially going sideways. And that tells me that this is a range-bound type of market. And so uh, the thing about ranges is, you know, for those that are fairly new to trading or maybe haven't traded a whole lot, they may be wondering, well, what's, what's the opportunity in trading ranges? I mean, this is going nowhere. Why would I want to trade something that is making no net progress one way or the other? And the answer to that lies that although this chart is moving net sideways and not making any real progress, prices are real comfortable trading in between this high and this low. There are many trends embedded inside this chart. And so we're going to try to find those points where we give ourselves a good opportunity of a good risk to reward ratio. And the other thing too is that we've got, since we've identified these levels of support and resistance, the other thing that we can do is wait for prices to stretch out into the support or resistance levels and then look for it to snap back, much like a rubber band. So as this rubber band expands, it gets tighter, and if I let go, it snaps back. So that's what we're looking at on, on a range. A way to trade it is we wait for a price extreme to occur where this rubber band gets stretched out, and we're just going to look for it to snap back towards the middle. So here's another range bound market. This is the US dollar, Japanese yen daily chart. And here's a situation where we start off prices consolidating, very comfortable with the range that it's trading in on the left hand side of the chart. 
and then all of a sudden we get a, a, a massive move to the downside. So I don't know if you guys remember or not, but that was back in March. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when uh, the earthquake hit in Japan, and then shortly thereafter the tsunami hit, and so there was a, a massive dislocation of capital where people were thinking that money was gonna have to be repatriated back into Japan in order to cover some of the claims and, and the losses and help rebuild. And so as that occurred, then the value of the Japanese yen increased significantly, dropping the price or dropping this exchange rate lower. And then as it was dropping, which at that time was all time highs for the Japanese yen. So a low on the chart was an all time high for the Japanese yen. As that occurred, then the Bank of Japan came in and said, wait a minute, guys, we, we can't handle this. And they intervened, and then they immediately pushed the prices back up, and then we saw this massive move to the upside. And then uh, shortly thereafter, you had your, your swing down, swing up, and then prices started to stagnate, and they started to get comfortable again, moving sideways. So you're going to get a combination of both ranges and trends on each chart, and so there are ways to trade this, and and help, ways to help identify what, where we might be at if we're in that state of, of stability where prices are comfortable trading sideways or whether we're in that state of trend where, where prices may, be wanna, may wanna be on the move. So how many folks are familiar with the ADX indicator? Raise your hand if you're familiar with the ADX. Okay, so it looks like maybe 50% of the folks in the room are. Well, what I've got at the bottom is the ADX, average directional indicator, and it's this black line that's oscillating up and down at the bottom of the chart. Now, what this indicator tells us is a strength of trend. It doesn't tell us where the trend is going. It just tells us if there's any punch behind it, if there's any momentum or any strength behind it. And so if it is at a high and elevated level, that means that that's a strong trend. If it's at a low level and really isn't going anywhere, then that indicates to us that it's not in a strong trend, which the opposite of that would mean that we're perhaps range bound. So we've got a New Zealand Swiss chart here. So um, we've got several colored boxes on this daily chart for the New Zealand Swiss. I've got a pink box on the left, I got an orange box in the middle, and I've got a blue box on the right. Now, what I've done is the New Zealand Swiss has periods of train, trend and it has periods of range on it. And you'll notice that on the pink box on the left, that prices have generally moved sideways and my ADX for the most part is below 25. There's a period in time where it did pop up above, but for the most part, um, most of those values are below 25. And then in my orange box, same type of thing. Prices stagnated sideways, most of those ADX values are below 25. So that's an indication to me that if prices are moving, it, it may not move too far. So much like this rubber band, you know, although price may continue to stretch out and move, but if there isn't any punch or momentum behind it, then it's gonna be more likely to snap back. And then in between the orange and the blue box, we've got most of those values above 25 for ADX. And as you can see, prices had more volatility associated with it. They had more of a directional movement uh, associated with it. And then after a strong move, and you get this, um, prices cannot move in a trend, you know, for infinite, it's gotta, it's gotta consolidate. So we get a strong trending move, let's say to the upside, it's gotta consolidate. It's gonna have to uh, trade sideways, perhaps even um, retrace a portion of that gain to kind of flush out those players who are late to the party. And then it, and a lot of times they'll resume in the direction of the trend. So price is trended to the downside, it needs to consolidate those gains, it trades sideways, and then we're gonna use that consolidation as a point to enter in and, and trade that in the direction of the preceding trend. So, um, so one, the next slide that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus in on the pink box. And so um, I've got not a whole lot of history to the left, but let's assume prior to the pink box, prices are moving to the upside, as you can kind of see. And so the next slide is a two hour chart on the New Zealand Swiss. Basically I've zoomed in on that pink box. Now that I've identified this area on the chart where I, I, I tend to find a range bound type of area, uh, now I'm gonna look and identify a trading opportunity. So to identify a trading opportunity, 
I look at my previous trend, it was up. So immediately, the first thing I'm doing is I'm looking for a buy signal. And then I just use whatever strategy I have, that's a range bound type of strategy, and I filter that only for buy signals. And so in looking at this, um, a lot of times I like to use long wicks, not as a primary signal, but I like to use it in conjunction with support and resistance. Long wicks tell me hidden levels of support and resistance. And so when I see, uh, in this case, uh, the New Zealand Swiss two hour chart, prices, whoops, prices came down and where I've got this horizontal brown line, prices found a low. And so there's a little bit of support that's starting to form. And right where that horizontal line is, that red candle above it even had a long wick to the downside. So what a long wick tells me is that prices traded down to that level, but not for very long. Immediately buyers rushed in, pushed it back higher. So when I see a long wick, that indicates support. And so therefore, a few candles later, we see that we have prices returning back down to the same level and another long wick is produced. So I'm getting started, starting to get some confirmation that there is some support in this area. And at this time, by looking at my daily chart, my ADX values are pretty low. So there isn't a whole lot of push behind this move to the downside. And so when I see this circled blue candle, very long wick to the downside, a much larger candle than a lot of the other candles out there and an extremely long wick, um, that is a, an additional point of confirmation that there is some hidden support in this area. And so at that point, I could either enter at the market on the next candle, or since we have a long wick, I could maybe try to catch a limit entry for prices to come back and retest a portion of that wick. But again, I'm gonna be filtering for a buy position because my previous trend was to the upside. And in this case, prices, as you can see, prices did come back and retrace about half of that distance of the wick. It's very common to see a behavior like that when you have an excruciatingly long wick, a very long candle and a long wick that takes up at least 50% of the, of the length of a long candle. So trading ranges, filter in the direction of the previous trend. And then if we find that the previous trend is up, we're gonna buy at support. And then if we find that the previous trend is down, we're gonna sell at resistance. Okay, so this is a strategy that I do trade during Asia. Before we got started, I, I was kind of chatting with some folks about this. Um, and so, when, um, uh, so I'd be happy to share this with you guys because sometimes on my live webinars, um, there are certain times when I will break this out and, and share this on the live webinar as well. So essentially, um, I like to trade cross pairs or something that um, I try to find those pairs where I don't think they're gonna move too far too fast. They're not gonna run away from me. Um, kind of like a soap opera. I can you know, come back a couple days later and not a whole lot's changed. That's, that's what I'm looking for on this type of a thing. I'm expecting not a whole lot of movement, not a lot of action. I want low and slow. But uh, in this case, I've got a, an Australian New Zealand chart. This is a daily chart. And so prices, um, and really for the Aus Australian New Zealand dollars, anybody traded this you know, in the past six months? Yeah, um, you know, maybe 40% of the room. And the moves that we've seen in the last six months on the Australian New Zealand dollar uh, really haven't occurred like this in a long time. Uh, Australian New Zealand used to be incredibly rangy. I mean, people, a lot of people don't even know, that, would know that it existed. Um, but because of some of these moves, and even on this chart, from the high point to the low point was 1,200 pips. That is a pretty large move on this pair in the course of four or five months. So I've got prices making a lower high and a lower low, so my trend is, is working its way to the downside. Um, but you'll notice that there are periods of consolidation, and, and you're going to tend to get more of this with a cross pair like the Australian New Zealand dollar. A, a big one that's a cross pair right now that is really going nowhere fast is the euro pound. Two economies, both of them are struggling. Uh, the average pip movement on the euro pound, uh, the daily ATR, average true range, uh, is less than 100. I want to say it's about 75. You know, so 75 pips a day, this thing moves from high to low on average. Uh, contrast that to something like a US dollar pair. You know, you're talking maybe in the low 100s. 
So uh, anyway, uh, so I'm, I'm chasing after something that doesn't tend to move very far, very fast. And uh, so I like to look, uh, for some reason, I've been attracted to the Australian, New Zealand, Aussie cat, Aussie in, but it's not exclusively these. Euro pound would fit into this as well. I've, honestly, I've tried uh, Euro pound a couple of times in the last couple of weeks and, and I ended up, both ended up being losing trades, but uh, that's not the point. You will have losing trades. The point is, is try to find something that's low and slow. And anybody familiar with CCI, anybody trade with CCI, the CCI indicators, the blue line I have at the bottom of my chart, okay? If you watch my webinars, I have the CCI on my charts, but I have it on my charts for only one reason, and it's this reason I'm about to share with you. There's many different ways you could trade CCI. So I am not suggesting that my way is the only way. This is just one of many different ways to trade this. You could trade CCI on a retracement, like the way you might do an RSI. You could trade CCI on a breakout, you know, like you can use with some of the other indicators as well. Uh, but the way that I like to trade CCI is on divergence. The reason that I trade CCI on divergence versus another currency is because of the calculation that goes into the CCI. Okay, what is divergence? And then I'll get into the calculation in a moment. Divergence is where you look at the price chart up above, prices are making a higher high, where I have that upward sloping black line. Prices are making a higher high. And then down on my CCI, it's not being confirmed. Price, uh, the CCI is making a lower high. And so that is giving me a divergence signal this indicates that prices are pushing higher, but there's no momentum behind it, or, 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 or not no momentum, a reduction of momentum. And so it would be much similar to driving down the road, running out of gas, okay? If you're out of gas, the car's still gonna move forward, but it's gonna be start to lose its velocity and you're not gonna be able to make it up the hill. So that's similar to what you get with divergence. It doesn't mean that it, prices are immediately gonna turn on you, it just means that our car has run out of gas and it's possible that it's not gonna go any further, okay? And so at that point, then I'll just take uh, on the second CCI lower high, I'll take the uh, cross down below the 100 in this case, which is the upper, upper gray line. So that's how I, would, uh, how I would enter in on that signal. Now, why CCI? RSI, the input value, when you enter that onto your trading platform, it calculates based on closed prices similar with stochastics or MACD. That's just the, the standard input value, closed prices. Well, the CCI, the standard input calculation for CCI is that it takes your high, your low, and your closed prices, runs it through the calculation automatically. So that's why I like the CCI, is because if I'm trading something that's low and slow, like an Australian New Zealand dollar or an Australian Canadian dollar, and prices, um, when you pull up a two hour chart or four hour chart and you just see a bunch of dojis going sideways. Well, the CCI is gonna take into account the wicks of those dojis. Whereas if you do the standard input on an RSI uh, or stochastics or a MACD and you're looking for divergence, um, it's only gonna do closed values and you're not gonna see the wicks of those candles into the computation. Uh, so, all right, so let's keep moving. Um, this is a, an important point I wanna, I wanna share with you guys when to trade them. There are actually certain times of the month, in my opinion, when uh, you tend to see ranges. And we just came out of one of those areas. The, it's what I call the pre-release calm. And this is gonna be the first week of the month. And what happens during the first week of the month? Non-farm payrolls. Last Friday, non-farm payrolls. Tuesday, uh, Monday night, which is Tuesday morning in Australia, you have the Reserve Bank of Australia coming out with their rate decision. And then typically on Thursday, you've got the Bank of England and the European Central Bank coming out with their rate decision. You have four major potentially market moving events all coming out in the span of, of five business days. And so when you get a lot of events packed into um, the small time frame, large institutions are gonna tend not to wanna initiate new positions. They're gonna wait for all this stuff to clear off the calendar, then they're gonna digest it and they're gonna be like, okay, we're gonna initiate this position now. So you can get some volatility during that week, but in anticipation of these news releases, you may get a stagnation of prices. Stagnation of prices, start looking to a ranging type of strategy to employ. 
that's when I'll use this divergence type of strategy, especially if you use it during an Australia-New Zealand currency pair. If the euro dollar and the Australian dollar, and if those currency pairs aren't going anywhere, well then the Australian-New Zealand dollar probably is not going anywhere either. Another way that we could trade it is on the ADX uh, with a drop below 25 on the ADX. And so I'm gonna share with you an Aussie CAD chart in a moment on that. And then uh, we can look to day trade during the Asian trading session, uh, where you're looking for a technical reason to enter a trade. During the Asian session, you have a reduced amount of liquidity out in the market. If you look at the three major hubs around the world when it comes to Forex transactions, you've got London, you've got New York, and you've got Tokyo. And London is gonna provide you the most liquidity. And then you've got New York, which is gonna be second on the list. And so when those two sessions cross over, which is in the evening or afternoon time in Europe and the morning time in New York, uh, which is gonna be you know, in the morning here in the US, that you're gonna see a lot of uh, liquidity and that's when you tend to see breakouts and trends occur. So that's all fine and good, but what about Tokyo? Well, Tokyo, still a lot of liquidity, especially when you compare it to maybe trading a small cap stock. Still a lot of liquidity out there could still uh, place a lot of trading volume. You don't have to worry about bidding against yourself in the market, um, but you tend to get more stagnation of prices during that Asian session, during the Tokyo session, which is gonna be between 2 p.m. and 6 a.m., roughly. So here's uh, another chart of the ADX again. Uh, Aussie CAD, it's been in a trend on the left-hand side. I've got a, a series of higher highs, higher lows, and then it consolidates that. As it consolidates in the orange box, my ADX value starts to drop below the red line at the bottom of the chart. And as it consolidates, eventually we did get a breakout to the downside, uh, but it ended up being, uh, depending on what type of a move you were looking for, it ended up being a false breakout, and then prices immediately uh, started resuming to the upside. So depending on where we were trading in that orange box, if we were at the end, if we were at the right edge of the orange box doing a range strategy, buying, we probably would have got stopped out of a trade. But as you can see, there was a very heavy support level that was starting to form. Could have possibly, if we'd seen it, provided a couple of opportunities. And one way to look at trading is, is you know, a lot of people when they're trying out a strategy, they'll look at a trade and, and if it's a winner or loser, they make a decision if the strategy works based on one trade. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is when you're trying something out, look at a series of, let's say 10 trades. How did those 10 trades work out? Because you will have losers. Hopefully you'll have some winners. Um, but it's that when you, when you add all those together, was the net effect of those 10 trades, um, you know, is that uh, a better indication of what you were expecting for that strategy? So that, that is the range piece of the puzzle. We're gonna go into a little bit of the trend. Trend is a bit more self-explanatory. Okay, I wanted to spend a little more time on range because typically, traders tend to do okay when trading ranges because you're talking about defined levels of support, defined levels of resistance. It's usually easier to identify on a chart. And so we wanted to make sure that, that uh, we had the resources out there for that. So, all right, trend. The trend is your friend. Um, a lot of different ways you can, you can trade trends, a lot of ways you can identify trends. Uh, an idealized wave here is an ABC move. You're looking for an ABC move. Uh, we're looking to buy on dips. We're looking to sell on rallies. And in this case, on the Australian US dollar, uh, I can tell this is an uptrend. I've got uh, you know, a one, two, three move, ABC move. Uh, prices are creating higher highs. Prices are creating higher lows. Somebody mentioned 200 period simple moving average. I throw that on the chart and I, my prices would probably be well above the 200 period simple moving average as well. There are many different ways that you can identify trend. And a lot of them are, are valid. Also, I have an upward sloping trend line. This indicates to me prices are continually moving higher. And so again, we're back to that Aussie CAD chart. So I wanted to share with you here how we can have both environments showing up on the same chart. And so when you test a strategy and you apply your strategy to the Aussie CAD chart, well, there are periods that it was trending. There was periods that it was range bound. Your back-tested results may look a little ho-hum because it, the conditions changed on you. So again, the one thing I want you guys to be able to walk away from is the strategy that you're trading 
get to know when does it do well? Is this a trending strategy or is this a ranging strategy? If it's a trending strategy, then cherry pick and look for the strongest trending markets that are out there. And if it's a ranging strategy, then try to find those that are low and slow with you know, little net progress in one direction or the other and trade it. And then it's gonna change. You may do it for a few days, a few weeks on a certain currency pair, and then, uh, and then it may change on you. It may start to break out. Your range may, may get broken. Uh, the Euro Swiss, weekly chart of the Euro Swiss. Swiss National Bank came out and they wanted to put a lid on prices. The Swiss franc uh, was getting very, very strong as we could tell by this chart. And, and they're an export-based economy. So as their Swiss franc gets stronger, meaning the price of this moves lower, well, their exports get more expensive just due to that currency exchange. And so the Swiss, they've been jawboning about this for a couple of years. And actually back in this circled area that I have on the chart, they were actually doing something about it at that time. The Swiss National Bank was physically going out intervening in the market and notice that prices stagnated and went sideways. And so that is a very, very tight range. I mean, these, these candles are very small. And then in uh, late 2009, they put out the fire and they called in the dogs. They said, this isn't working. I mean, we're trying to make the Swiss franc weaker. We're intervening in the market and all we're doing is going sideways. And so, so they gave up and they, they said, we're not doing this anymore. And then, uh, and then the market forces took over Capital was starting to leave Europe and go to Switzerland, part because uh, two reasons. Geographic location, it was very easy for capital to move from one economy to the other. The second reason is because a Swiss franc is a, a safe haven type of currency. And with the turmoil that's going on in Europe, money was looking for that, that, that safe, re, uh, safe place to go. Now, the problem in Europe, as many of you have probably heard of by watching television, is a lot of the European nations are just overwhelmed with debt. It's getting to the point where they're gonna have a hard time paying back this debt. And if they don't pay back all of their debt, somebody gets stiffed, okay? Who's left holding the bag? And what the fear is, is that this is gonna become a domino effect. Greece has made the news. Greece is, is, is the one that's been in a lot of headlines. Um, but I will tell you, and this is my opinion, my opinion is that the 800 pound gorilla in the European room is Italy, okay? So Greece is important, in my opinion, only if it affects Italy and Italy's ability in order to pay back the folks that have lent them money. Why is, my, why is Italy important? Well, Italy is about the 10th largest nation in the world. It's the, tenth largest, uh, the third largest nation in the European area. However, they've got the third largest debt market in the world. So they owe a ton of money. These people are big and they have a, a huge debt market. So if, if they start to default, there's a lot of people that stand to lose uh, during that. So, uh, so Greece is in the news because the fear is that if Greece defaults, which seems very likely when their uh, two-year yield is upwards of 50%, I mean, I don't think it's if, I think it's a matter of when. Yeah, it's the, the short end of the curve is, is very high. Um, but if they default, and then it may, if, if that affects Spain, and then if that affects, it, you know, if it makes its way towards Italy, you know, so if Italy is the fifth domino, and Greece is the first domino, and they move over, and they knock over the second domino, and it knocks over the third domino, if eventually it makes its way to Italy, I think that's really what the big problem is, is, is that protection on Italy. So this is obviously a very strong trend because of the fundamental picture and the backdrop that's going on. And so money's been heading over towards a Swiss franc and leaving the currency. So when we're looking to trade trends, again, cherry pick, be super picky. Look for, demand the strongest trends. And again, you can look at the chart, which one's been moving the most number of pips over the course of the last 100 or 200 days. Uh, filter in the direction of the trend use a breakout or a trend following type of strategy. Those are, those are ways to enter into it. Um, we could use a, a simple retracement type of uh, strategy, trend following strategy. Here's an eight hour chart. I've got slow stochastics down at the bottom and uh, I've got some trend lines drawn at the top on the price. 
And what I can do is, is I could wait for prices to come up to the trend line. Also wait for my stochastics to cross down, which is the first gold rectangle on the left. And uh, when I get that signal of my stochastics K line crossing the D line, the, the, the blue line crossing the red line, then that could be my signal to go ahead and enter into this trade. Um, I don't have to have stochastics. I could use just the support and resistance levels, my, my black resistance line in this case. I could use um, candle formations you know, to help time that entry if I get a bearish candle formation up at the top. So I uh, was just looking for a simple trend following system. It doesn't need to be anything complex. Sometimes we try to make things a, a bit more difficult than what it, what it needs to be. Um, trend is your friend. Um, be picky, be demanding on strong trending pairs. So if something is reaching out to a multi-year high, obviously there's some strength behind it because otherwise it wouldn't create a multi-year high. There's, there's a, um, a dislocation of capital. Capital is decided, I no longer want to be here. I want to move over to this economy. And then you get an Australian US dollar increase um, because, uh, uh, because of that flight of capital. We see a change in appetite. Also, I have the third point on here. Change in appetite or risk. That means if we're moving from a risk on environment to a risk off environment, you may see a change in trend. You may see new trends develop. So lately, we've started to see a risk off type of environment. Stock market has started to sell off. Um, we've seen that Australian US dollar, which was in a very nice strong uptrend, is starting to move sideways, maybe even starting to drift lower a little bit as, as the stock market and, and people are, are, are taking money off the table or taking a risk out of the market, moving towards safety. All right, folks, we are one minute till the hour. Um, I'll go ahead and dismiss you guys. Uh, thank you guys very much for joining me. I'm going to be available up front for a few more minutes. Um, again, if you have questions that uh, you want to get answered, I'll be up here for a few more minutes. You can also grab my card if you want to email me later, if you have a question later on. Absolutely. And thank you guys very much for joining me and look forward to uh, seeing you guys throughout the rest of the expo.